our air defense is what I'm talking about in the part three of the combat, uh, combat COVID-19 series. So let me start off from where I took off the last time. I did say that during the lockdown, there would be transformational learnings. That would create a paradigm shift and think about a positive change. And uh, I was sort of curious to know what happened when the lockdown restrictions started easing out. Well, it's not been very positive because I'm seeing a pushback towards, uh, well, pushback to the old or a pushback to the change, particularly in the healthcare sector. For example, when we were moving towards telehealth, all of a sudden lockdowns got started easing out and all the doctors are rushing back to the clinics, rushing back to the hospitals and uh, going back to the old ways. I'm not very happy with this, but I guess that's human nature. Let's hope that, uh, well, this, uh, this uh, change uh, does show up in some way. But complacency and the learnings uh, that have been forgotten is probably responsible for this. And we've had very little transformational learning. So uh, there's been no real safeguard against future calamities. However, let me uh, be a bit more optimistic and say that let's see how things pan out as things go. But we have to learn our lessons always from history. Before I actually go into uh, what we should do about the air, the air defense against the coronavirus or any virus or bacteria for that matter. 1918 influenza pandemics, there were a lot of learnings that we have forgotten. Now, this pandemic, almost 100 years later, again came up as the swine flu. Now, what we had learned from this, these pandemics were that this virus originated from birds, went on to pigs and went on to humans. So there was this animal link that was there. There was something very odd about this virus or this influenza uh, pattern that instead of uh, coming up in winter, it came up in spring and summer, which was odd. And this is what we see with the COVID-19 too. The other important lesson was that the second wave was deadlier than the first. So remember, we've all just been through the first wave and I'm bracing myself for the second wave. I know that we expect it to be deadlier, but I'm hoping that perhaps the measures that we have taken would not make it as deadly. The other interesting thing was, yes, they did report a lot of um, patients and these were mainly soldiers that were returning from the World War I with lung edema. And then they talked about hemorrhages and clot attacking and killing young people, which is again what the pattern that we're seeing now. And uh, we could attribute this to the lies and denials by the government then because a lot of information was not available. But I hope that things have changed over the years and that we can depend upon our government to at least give us a large part of the truth. A lot of people did not realize in my research, I was quite surprised that what my research dug up that Bengaluru was also affected quite badly by this uh, 1918. So in June of 1918, this infection had spread through Mumbai. Thousands fell in. Hundreds of them died of hypoxia, lung edema. First wave passed through Bangalore in late June without causing much harm. All right, it looks like quite similar than what's happening here. The second wave in mid-September was deadlier. So if hist history were to re repeat itself, um, I think we can expect another wave to come. And by end of November, of course, the disease was finally under control. But to my surprise, what was reported was that in the state of Mysore, almost 200,000 people died and 40,000 in Bengaluru alone. So if you really look at the population of Bengaluru around that time, it was not even half a million. So about 8% of the population got wiped out. Very significant. And therefore, um, one should realize that no matter which part of the world you're in, there is, um, well, nobody is insulated from the wrath of this uh, virus. We know the ways in which the virus is spread. For example, by air, coughing, sneezing, etc. Close contact and touching objects, fomites as we call them. But today we're going to focus on the battle against the air or rather a defense against airborne modality of the spread of this virus. Airborne transmission, uh, initially it was, it was said that it was not through, through the air, this virus only spread through contact, etc. But then of course, very soon it was proved uh, wrong and we found that yes, droplets can carry it. And therefore, in reality, we know and the hence social distancing has a very good role to play that at a certain distance, if you maintain a good amount of social distance, it's less likely that you will contract this through the air. Similarly, washing hands and other methods came. But as I said, today we'll focus on the air. I'm going to talk about specific um, 
areas where I feel that we need to do some out of the box thinking. We need to come up with good solutions, and that's where uh, I'm going to pick out on certain aspects of the air transmission. One is this particulate matter. Now, the question is, can pollutants carry coronavirus? What we have seen in certain studies that have come recently, particularly through the Italian experience, is that several viruses such as the avian flu, measles, which were proved in the past uh, that could travel through air pollution and that led to a higher rate of infection. So hence, it should not be surprising for us to expect that in areas where there were some more pollution, the spread would be more like the industrial parts of northern Italy with a higher rate of infection than the rural regions. Also, it might explain that the low rate of infection during lockdown was not merely because of social distancing, but it could have been also because of the fact that the pollution levels just came down, the number of vehicles, uh, industries closed down, and that uh, uh, also was a very important factor to prevent the airborne spread. That means, in other words, is, uh, is, that, is this virus riding on those particles and are able to travel longer if we have pollution? Same reason probably why uh, cigarette smoke would probably carry the virus much further than somebody who's not smoking. So we had some experience with this, uh, with the method of pr uh, protecting passengers or look at the aircraft that came from Wuhan. So the simplest method is disinfection. So this of course, doesn't apply to the air, but they thoroughly disinfected using Viraclean MD-125. Uh, and uh, the water in the uh, air aircraft is often uh, disinfectant using chlorine, um, gene and ozone very probably used. So we know that there are some um, methods of disinfection, methods of cleansing the air in the aircraft. The only thing that we have learned now is that is, is that good enough or we need to do something more. So this is the method that they carried out for those planes that got passengers back from Wuhan and they needed a thorough disinfecting. So which brings me to the various methods in which we, were, we are able to clean the air. The commonest method which is used in operation theatres in hospitals, we use HIPAA filters. Now, unfortunately, HIPAA filters, uh, they can filter particles which are more than 0.1 micron, whereas uh, the viruses are typically 0 0.05 to 0 0.03 micron. So obviously, we know that it's not enough to filter viruses. And in the aircraft, they change the entire air is changed once every three to four minutes. And I did not know this, but even, even the existing technology took in some fresh air and did replace the air with the outside air. So that was a, that was a learning for me. Now, HIPAA filters are effective at capturing greater than 99% of the airborne microbes. This is the statement of IATA. Uh, my question is here again, 99% or whatever, it's fine, but what does it do for the viruses? So that's most important. It's, it's not, if we just able to filter the bacteria and the viruses get through, then that 1% of, uh, doesn't really help me. The other very important part in the airline is that the air is usually dry and the biggest culprit appears to be dry air. You know, nostrils are dry, your airways is dry, and therefore your immunity or your defense against the um, bacteria and viruses itself gets cut down. So yes, the other methods that they add on is UV uh, lamps. They subject the air to ultraviolet filtration, kill viruses, bacteria, etc. There are many such devices available in the market for domestic use as well as for commercial use. And yes, we do know the limitations, but these are not really as effective as they want us to believe. These are uh, they need a long duration of exposure, and they're really not as as effective. We are seeing some new methods coming into the airline. The aviation clean air. It, they use the principle of ionization, or in other words, they use cold plasma uh, rather than using filters. Now, this has come into small aircraft. This has come into Gulfstream G550. These are all the, the small private aircraft. Recently, it's been certified for Boeing 737 and, and uh, BBJs. So we know that now with the small aircraft, they are going to shift into using these methods to actually sterilize the air. That's going to be very, very important for the uh, airline industry if they are to survive. Because the passenger confidence has really gone down. We don't see many people wanting to travel now. But if I were to be happy or satisfied that the air that I'm breathing inside the cabin is fairly clean, or at least clean of uh, most of the bacteria or pathogens, I would be happy to travel.
So this is going to be a very important factor for the airline industry to bounce back. And I'm, I've been in touch with some people from the airline industry. Hopefully, in one of my future talks, I should be able to get some of those experts here to talk on that. But this seems very encouraging that from the smaller planes to the bigger planes and approvals have been uh, also been, uh, been given very quickly for these matters. And the principle they use over here this is very interesting that the air which is that the air environmental control system has not changed. You can just get the point over here. So the air of course is, is, take, is sucked out here. It is uh, purified. It goes to what is known as the ACA component and I will talk about this component shortly. And then it is pushed back over here and is fundamentally they talk about ionization as a method kill these uh, pathogens. So it effectively and proactively kills them. There is no filter over here. There's absolutely no filter, which makes a lot of sense to me. So let's see how this works. So the fundamental part of uh, this process, it's basically it's called as a cold plasma. So the good thing about this system is it is not depend dependent upon whether it's a bacteria, fungus, virus. Any pathogen, it will basically work at uh, severing the hydrogen bonds on the cell surface and then they can't survive, they can't mutate and they will uh, either not be able to reproduce or they will quickly die. So this makes a lot of sense. No filter, you're directly attacking proactively. It's not a filtering system. It makes a lot of sense and I, I think we will be seeing more and more of these at least coming into the aircrafts. Um, previously, the aircraft industry always compared themselves. They always gave this reason that you know, our air in the, inside the flight is cleaner than the mall. It's cleaner than um, office spaces. But um, that is not good enough because when you are in a close space traveling for a long, like a capsule for a long period of time, it, you need to have a very high uh, degree of uh, cleanliness in the air. So I think they have got out of that and they're looking at can we actually kill these bacteria viruses proactively. And I was quite impressed by this technology. It was, it's not a new technology. It was just not being applied uh, in the airlines and today when they're waiting approvals and these approvals are coming very fast and I'm, we are looking to a much cleaner environment in the airlines. It's a small box that does it. So um, the data that came from here is very interesting for two reasons. One is that I quickly, I check whether the viruses are being killed. 30 minutes and 93%. Okay, I'll take it. It's not too bad. But interestingly, tuberculosis, which is a bacteria, 60 minutes and the kill rate is only 69%. So again, remember that uh, it's not necessary that something which is effective against viruses can also be equally effective against bacteria. But it's important to know that a large part of the bacteria, commonly bacteria, MRSAs, for example, and uh, some of the spores, most of them are able to be, well, decimated by this technology. So I think it's only a question of how you handle it and to what extent you want. So where you really uh, would like to be is someplace where the viral load or the bacteria or the pathogenic load is less so that most bodies immune normal healthy person or a moderately healthy person should be able to you know go through without picking up or spreading any of the infections so um, this technology as i research further I realized that it's there in hospitals there are small uh, boxes that you can buy for your own room for your office for your space and uh, they're not very expensive so uh, Fundamentally, I think we will see a lot more of this plasma or cold plasma that uh, uses high voltage and a discharge through the tube, which causes this cluster of ions, which finally suffocate or destroy bacteria or pathogens over here. So this, I think, is going to, we're going to see a lot of these uh, in the various uh, environments that we work on, particularly hospitals, wards, OTs, intensive care units. The, but that is one aspect of it. The second aspect of this is how do we compartmentalize um, the air circulation in such a way that where the high level of sterility is required, like inside the aircraft, like in the OT, like in the ICU, and that required from the ward, how do we segregate the air movement in, such, in these places? Now, when you talk about uh, the modern hospitals or modern offices with centralized air conditioning, centralized air conditioning creates a huge challenge for this. Whereas many of the hospitals that have individual air conditioners or uh, 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 the split ACs, etc., it seems that it's going to be a lot easier to do work with them. So it may well happen that some of the older hospitals would be easier to uh, adapt this technology than some of the newer ones, and they will have to uh, have a more complicated system. So this is one thing the personal protective equipment or the PPEs with respect to the physical contact. Just focus on the air, the breathing. 
and that's one of the things that's going to be a big problem big challenge because it is all well to see in the photographs you know my own brother ashok uh, who works in new york city uh, as one of the frontline workers there uh, his basic uh, experience was it's all very well but it's it's extremely uncomfortable to be in that suit especially if you have to be in there be there for 12 hours 8 to 12 hours 10 hours in, in that and the environment outside is not very friendly suffocating for surgeons it's very difficult to to operate and work with that for the nurses as you can see they also don't know how to work with the system and one of the biggest challenges you can't speak to each other because through that you have to either shout in fact there are also new innovations are coming about where there will be a small mic and you know they'll amplify your voice and you actually people have started using the scuba diving signs and and actually in the in the OT anesthetists have developed hand sign language to be able to quickly convey to the surgeon and the nurse what they want to do so this is innovations that are happening as we speak uh, there is a company that is uh, reusing this ppes and doing a vapor phase uh, hydro, uh, hydrogen peroxide method in bulk so that the ppes will have a longer life and they can be re-sterilized and sent back so a lot of innovations happening but today we're going to focus on the air part and ashok what he did use he use he did use this this mask very interesting again john will tell us more about this mask product of uh, john's innovation and um, that has taken into consideration all these disadvantages you know the the way the uh, the, the cumbersomeness of the mask uh, and the way it has to fit in easily and small things like spectacles and how do you manage with people who wear glasses don't wear glasses etc so this is where innovations will happen very quickly probably even on a monthly basis or weekly basis if not earlier that's one part the other uh, feedback that i did get from my brother ashok was that it's 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 quite difficult to remember there is a sequence in which you have to put on these uh, ppes and you have to remove it now it may seem very obvious but when you actually doing it you tend to forget you forget the sequence it goes wrong so there's a lot of learning that has to happen when you're using the ppes the ppes have to become more friendly it should be more snug it should be light it should be comfortable to wear for the doctors and the healthcare workers to work efficiently for example if you look at this ppe which is right over here you can't expect a surgeon or a healthcare worker to wear this Uh, typically you know uh, where they would uh, use it in movies or go where you have ebola virus or some kind of uh, local epidemic you can't expect somebody to work with that it's very nice to it looks like a science fiction uh, uh, suit but definitely you cannot and uh, also it looks a bit scary imagine your healthcare worker approaching you with this kind of masks and all kinds of weird things coming out from there and from the nose from the from the face uh, so children would definitely you know be fearful as it is the parents of scared children about doctors is all the more reason they'll run away from their doctors and the boogie men so there has to be a lot of innovations that have to happen over here similarly when you're looking at the icu the ventilators some of the in invasive non invasive let's take the non invasive the face mask nasal mask and the helmet again you see a similar product over here in the icu you see this mask this gives a little bit of overall protection this mask exposes the skin exposes the and of course we also there is a uh, something called as three zone two path as a service again uh, this was through the experience in italy in, in a italian hospital that uh, by by making various zones and creating various paths the movement of how the healthcare workers take place and again this is where um, dr john will be able to give us some very good insights into uh, how this works and how his company actually delivers this service Uh, and creates this for various uh, medical institutions the other thing we have to remember is that ventilator is not always the answer a large number of patients in fact 9 out of 10 covid patients it is uh, reported they actually don't make it so the whole question is that how useful are ventilators and how much should we be focusing on ventilators and are they ventilator related deaths 30% of the deaths are often not related to the disease is often been attributed to the ventilator use itself there are four or five ways in which a uh, person uh, uh, the wrong ventilator or the wrong parameters on the ventilator can lead to uh, increased uh, incidence of uh, death now while we come out of this let's look at some things that are you know quite amusing but i think it's great because out of the box thinking uh, you many of you must have heard about the restaurant in amsterdam they they have actually introduced this quarantine greenhouses you can sit over there like a pod and uh, you be in a closed space the waiter waitresses are as you can see they wearing visors and uh, to keep some kind of barrier there they carrying long trays like wooden planks that they can push serve you from a distance some they've all gone to disposable menu cards uh, this has been one 
uh, area where there's been a lot of uh, spread of uh, the viral infections. They've got small cubicles like this made of uh, plexiglass and that's creating a sort of a barrier between two people eating. I don't know how romantic this is going to be, but already some restaurants have introduced this. So yes, you can see a lot of innovations coming in. Plexiglass barriers all over. I think this is going to be the biggest market now. Plexiglass everywhere you go, there's going to be mobile glasses. Wherever you're talking to a person, it will be through a barrier. And probably this will become the new normal, I suppose. So this is going to be quite common for us. In fact, it, we may feel very awkward when somebody directly speaks to us and uh, we may become more sensitive to this. I don't know, but I think this is what's going to happen. Let's see, let's wait and see how, how these changes come in. I've even come across something called as a personal air purifier. You wear this pendant around your neck and that's supposed to first absorb fine uh, the particles, then streams of negative ions attaches to this airborne particles, making them too heavy to remain airborne and then it decomposes this. Now, it looks very nice animated and in this picture, I don't know whether it works, but if it does work, then yes, it makes a lot of sense. Each one having a small device that makes sure that air around you is trapped, taken care of and thrown. So personal uh, you know, device for, uh, for domestic use. So this, these are the few interesting things and you know, we come across when, we do, when, I, when I did my research, I found it quite interesting, amusing and uh, hoping that they, are, they, are, they have some truth in it. Uh, we have two experts over here. Let's see what they say about these devices. So let us, in conclusion, let me uh, tell you the medical pandemic will go on and on and on. We will have to live with it. We just, uh, we don't know. Some say two years, some say forever. So the medical part pandemic, this virus is going to remain. New viruses are going to come. That's not going to, that's not going to change very much. We have this chance to change. So the medical one is when the death rates start coming down and we know, okay, now the medical pandemic is over, but there is a fear pandemic. There's a pandemic of fear. There's a, there's a social pandemic and that is very important for us. We can end the social pandemic even earlier. We don't have to wait for the medical pandemic. The social pandemic may never end because even if after the medical pandemic ends, the social pandemic may continue and the people may still live in this fear. So it's very important for us while we are discussing various methods of prevention, of prevention of spread, controlling of the pandemic. What are, can we do as far as the social aspect of the social pandemic? How do we end it? I think this has a lot to do with the mental state and it is impact, or, or impact of this pandemic on the mind. And we will be having one entire session uh, led by Dr. Nilima on the um, health, the mental health aspect and how to deal with these aspects both uh, for, the, for the civil population and the frontline doctors who today we see are being affected quite badly by the burnout syndrome. So thank you, Dr. Skadambi. Uh, thank you, Pooja. Um, and I'm very happy to join the both of you this morning. I was actually on call, and as things go on call, you're doing nothing until you're doing something. So I got called down to a trauma. I had a chance to use my mask, uh, the mask that we developed, which I have here, as part of, uh, uh, it started as a, a project, uh, an international collaboration of various people around the world working on converting these snorkel masks into PPE. And True Health, our company, spun off of this and created, uh, said, we need to get this out to the front lines. We saw that it worked. It was part of the FDA submission uh, that, was, that took place end of March, beginning of April, and we were authorized with a face mask with off-label use as a respirator. So you can see this here, if you guys can see the video or you can see on the slide, the uh, respirator, uh, the filter that's on the top of this takes what's a, a sealed mask that works the same as a gas mask, basically. It turns it into a respirator. And so you have pure air coming in and you're breathing out through that as well. And what we're doing is we're innovating around how to make this more patient friendly because the gas mask industry looks pretty scary and those the devices are not designed for communication, they're not designed for use with patients. And so while they do protect you, they're not the ideal use uh, of a protective device in the pandemic. And with the shortage of N95, the shortage of uh, protective equipment, we saw a big opportunity to bring something that's better for patients, better for doctors, better for healthcare providers, and also used widely among those that, as Dr. Gadami was pointing out, need protection uh, in the pandemic. And if you wanna to go to the next slide, And so, you know, just to continue here, you know, the, um, we are now understanding the global supply chain of these masks and 
tapping into them because there's a stress in the supply chain of other masks out there. And what we're doing is we're bringing something that's a non-stress supply chain to the front lines. And so in addition to that, we think that there's a need to deploy PPE in an effective manner. So it's not just about bringing uh, everybody gets a mask, everybody gets protection, and then we're all set. There's a lot also behavioral components to this as well. And that's where the three zones, two paths service comes in. And this was successfully deployed in Italy, South Korea, and in Wuhan, where they dropped healthcare worker infections to literally zero. And this is gonna be, we believe that this is gonna be the way forward for hospitals when they're dealing with COVID surges, is that what is seen coming in your community, you would activate protocols and activate responses to change your hospital into a COVID ready hospital. And this involves changing the zoning of your hospital. And so it's not just patients come in and they go to where there's a bed available, but it's actually patients come in, you know or you don't know the COVID status, they go to a certain ward, you test them, and then if they're COVID, they go to an isolated area. And you have zones, uh, hot zone where it's very sick patients, uh, intermediate zone where you have perhaps COVID positive patients under proper air ventilation, not as sick, maybe just needing some oxygen, and then uh, you have a clean zone where you're doing the regular business of the hospital. And the idea is that you don't have staff going between the zones because what staff do is they end up tracking Then this was CDC noted this in emerging infectious disease back in April it was published is that pay, the providers when they're not attentive to where they're moving through the hospital end up tracking COVID all around the hospital. And that's part of the danger of this. And this is what results in so many healthcare workers being infected. It was 10% of the healthcare workforce in Italy. Uh, there was quite a, a lot of infections in China and elsewhere. And in the United States, where we've actually donated some masks to a hospital in Massachusetts, there's out of 1,300 workers, 300 were infected. And so what we're doing as a health IT firm and a digital health firm, in addition to doing the PPE, is we're using software to help hospitals analyze their floor plans to be able to rapidly deploy this. And also, as, as Dr. Ganami re uh, referenced, the donning and doffing or the taking off of your protective equipment is a very dangerous time. And it's very, what they did in, in Italy and they did in China and they did in South Korea was they had staff dedicated 24 seven to this. We think that you can use health, health IT technology to do virtual staff that can be in multiple places at once and watching multiple providers and provide this at a lower cost uh, as well as a more effective way and then use AI and machine learning to help people get, to help healthcare providers properly un take off the protective, the equipment that's been protecting them. And so those are some of the innovations that we're working on and that we hope to be deploying throughout the pandemic. And we think that this will be needed in future pandemics as well. And so as we see the waves, we'll go into the zoning method and then and the wave subsides, we come back to regular business. And we see that as a protocol that'll be part of the way healthcare is run uh, indefinitely into the future. And so with that, I'll hand it back over. Yeah, that's great. Thanks, uh, Dr. John. Does the, uh, like the, the mask that, uh, that's been created, the true mask, uh, mm -hmm. does it eliminate the need for any other protection on the inside or, and even to the point of gowns? Or what, is, uh, what, what does it help uh, restrict? Yeah, so it's airway protection for you, respiratory protection. And so when we're using this with a filter on top and there's a variety of filter sources and so one to answer the question simply it's an uh it's a respirator and so it provides mask uh mask protection for your eyes and for your breathing so you'll still need to wear a gown with this you would still need to wear gloves etc um the big innovation here is not just that you have integrated eye protection like other respirators on the market uh, that are from 3M and others, but what you have is an ability to use any type of filter that is a viral bacterial filter. So they can work with a variety of medically cleared filters, as well as kind of ad hoc filter sources if, if you're in a resource constrained setting. And many of the masks on the market don't allow for that. They allow for a proprietary filter that's specific to their mask to be utilized. And so we see this as a big way to increase the uptake of respiratory protection uh, in air, uh, when we have the setting of COVID where supply chains are stressed and you may not have the filters available for your other mask. All right. So, John, uh, that's, that's great. But I just wanted to, uh, the way I'm looking at these pictures, I'm almost seeing there's a, there's a sort of a two-path 
Is that what uh, the two paths is about? It's one way that you cannot cross and some will be on the outer side. So actually physically, there'll be no crossing over. That's why that barrier was created. Uh, is, that a, is that what we're seeing in mm -hmm. the, the photograph? And uh, the hospitals will be designed also to have this kind of uh, permanent... Uh, and we, we, do you think that's going to happen in just uh, COVID-related or uh, hospitals that are treating COVID patients? Or it's going to be a, a feature that's going to trickle down to every healthcare facility where you would be having this kind of barriers that would be working? What is your prediction on this? Yeah, so what we're trying to do is enable uh, hospitals to be able to put up these systems quickly and efficiently and then take them down so when they need to get back to business. And so these are and temporary barriers that we put up. Right. And we would see my question here is, yeah, yeah. My question here is, just as a matter of principle, I know it's a bit complicated, it could be, but what about the air? As you can see, they're standing apart, but the air is common, <clears throat> all right? Yes, mm -hmm. we are through this. So how are you going to segregate the air? If, if it can be explained in a very simple, uh, simple way, quickly, how do you segregate the air that people Yeah, have? so we, we have, that's something you need to do with the HVAC and with using uh, negative pressure rooms and paying attention to how the airflow is done in the hospital to begin with. And that is uh, why we have on our team uh, air handling engineers, uh, mechanical engineers that are able to come and help hospitals be able to do this. And that's going to be on a kind of an ad hoc basis, but using digital technology in order to figure that out with the floor plans mm -hmm. of the hospital. So there's one right? more question for him. Oh, one more. Uh, yeah. In fact, uh, uh, Mr. Vaidyan Atham himself has a question. Um, John, his question is, uh, from looking at the picture, you know, how do you prevent the exhaled air that forms a mist and uh, difficulty in sight? How is that addressed by a product like this? Won't it uh, very quickly become very difficult to see? So that's a great question, and that's a concern with any full face respirator, and also for any type of eye protection that's utilized in healthcare. And so I have on the, I have in my pocket a pair of, um, you know, simple uh, eye protection, and then I have my mask as well. And the picture actually has a little bit of glare, so it's not quite all fog. What we uh, have is there's different chambers, and so there's actually a separate mouth chamber from the eye chamber, and so you actually have uh, more fogging in the mouth chamber. Uh, which doesn't affect your vision and the eye chamber is kept separate with one-way valves and so that's one of the innovations that we've done is to to make sure that visibility is maintained um, it's a little misleading in the picture because there's some glare that's reflecting onto the mask um, not quite that's not quite fog uh, but the um, but that's a it's top of our mind because you know you need to be able to see in the hospital and it's something we've been addressing and we think that it's uh, at an acceptable level um, due to the design of the mask with the one-way valves. Is there a property in the material itself, since this is used in scuba and other things which involve inhaling and exhaling, is there some sort of property in the material itself that, um, you know, even if it sort of turns into mist and drips down, that it doesn't actually stay foggy? Is there a coating or something? Yeah, so, you know, the, the scuba, uh, the snorkel technology has been very attentive to that scenario and so i think they've done a number of innovations as well in that regard and that also just the airflow and the way that the air is compartmentalized within the mask also prevents that you can also use some off-the-shelf anti-fog uh, there's uh, actually like sprays out there that you can set the mask and rub in and that also prevents fogging but we haven't found that to be really necessary and i've been using this for hours at a time and multiple physicians have used it for uh, for many hours uh, operating and haven't had too much of an issue. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, we can move to the slide for uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan. John, I don't know if people have realized that uh, you filed for this patent in March, right? Or February, March. And we've already got it approved by FDA. I've never seen anything like, you know, that quick an approval. It takes millions and billions of dollars and it takes so many years. So. Have you seen, is that the change that is happening within the FDA that we had hoped would happen? It would be a, a lot yeah. of uh, fast tracking. I think this is a very good example. Am I right in saying that you filed for the patent in March? Is that right or earlier? Yeah, so we filed for the FDA. So we did an emergency use authorization at the end of March and heard back at the beginning of April. And the whole like testing process took place very quickly, um, but very thoroughly with the, with the group around the world. And so. Yes, the FDA. I think that's extremely encouraging. Extremely encouraging. I've never known yeah. that work that fast, and I think that that's one of the things I I talked about in my first uh, like uh, first uh, series, the first part of the series, that I hope that this is uh, going to the FDA is going to ease out. 
And I think today we're going to look at a global rather than the FDA USA. It's going to be more of a global decision. Very good. Uh, Pooja, can you bring uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan in? I'll, I'll show his slide here. Thank you, Dr. Gadambi. Dr. Um, John, for the excellent uh, presentation. You extensively covered about uh, the importance of air, the circulated or the recirculated air in be it a OT or a hospital or for that matter, aircraft. Um, it's an extraordinarily important matter. Um, it's a complicated matter because the domain of air has been taken over by the air conditioning, HVAC industry, as it's called, heating, ventilation, air conditioning industry. But the current uh, COVID scenario, coronavirus scenario, is going to create a distinctly post-COVID world, which is going to be far more sensitive on the environment one is exposed to. Um, if I just, uh, you wanted me to address about particulate matter, I will uh, talk about that. Just if I may just uh, share a particular point on the post-COVID uh, um, sensitivities emerging. I believe one will be on the personal hygiene. Uh, when we talk about hygiene, we talk about sanitizing our hand, keeping a mask and related things. But there will be a great, great sensitivity amongst individuals in the type of air they are exposed to. By wearing a mask, you are trying to prevent, quote unquote, the wrong air being inhaled by you. By washing our hands, we are getting sensitive on not contacting the virus and taking it, inhaling it in. So as we start understanding the personal hygiene, that's what uh, in the slide left side bubble that uh, you can see, the air around you, my air, the bubble around me, personal hygiene will become extremely sensitive. A set of technologies will emerge in that direction. The second thing that is distinctly going to become relevant is the need for smart spaces. When I say smart spaces, we are trying to talk about indoor. We are not talking about outdoor. We know about outdoor air. Talking about indoor air, uh, Dr. John uh, put a slide about the multiple, uh, you know, a way a hospital uh, track would be. He talked about the patients, the uh, entry-level patient, the high fever and the intense COVID. There was a query by Dr. Kadem Kadembi about the air circulation part of it. The second issue is about the smart spaces, the need to ensure that the space you are in, be it hospital space, OT or an aircraft space, or the room is sterile, clean air. There will be multiple technologies that will emerge. Now, specifically talking about particulate matter, uh, for the purpose of sharing a thought with all the uh, webinar attendees, uh, we, are, we have been hearing about the phrase particulate matter, PM. We hear phrases like PM10, PM2.5. What they mean is the diameters of the particulate matter. When you say PM10, you say 10 micrometer is the diameter of particulate matter. When you say PM2.5, you say 2.5 micrometer diameter of the particulate matter. Um, what is particulate matter? If we try, we, we talked about the dimension. When we try to ask a question, what is particulate matter? Let me, uh, let's simplistically view this way. The air around you has three types of dust. One is, let's say, physical dust, a small little sand particle or dry dust leaves or whatever it is that you say. That's a physical dust. Then there is a chemical dust per se. That is uh, SOx, NOx, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide or nitrogen dioxide air impurities that that are in the air. Like an automobile exhaust hugely adds to the carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide pollution. And the third is the biological. When I say biological uh, particulate matter, we are talking about, let us say, pollen. You know, we know that air is full of pollen. For asthmatics, we say he's sensitive to pollen. So this are biological particulate matter. Now, once these three kick up in the air, the physical or the chemical that's a layer or the biological, what happens in the atmospheric domain is, for the quote and uh, the physical, when I use the word quote, I'm saying Q, U, O, T, E, but what happens with the physical particulate matter is, as it kicks up in the air, the thin layer of carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide or sulfur dioxide coating takes place on that. Similarly, on the biological particulate matter, 
it could be a pollen but as it comes around in the air matter there is a coating of the chemical layer that happens so when we talk about particulate matter 2.5 or 10 micron what we say is the typical ambient air particulate matter that might be not just physical will have a chemical coating or it could be a biological particle that's got a chemical coating now this becomes very very harmful for a human being when we inhale air with let's say particulate matter in that the uh, nose nose to filter the the hair follicles in the nose it filters out the 10 micron big particulate matter we all know when there is dust in the air we tend to take our hand to the nose and we know there is a muck of air and we clean up our nose and we feel the big particulate matter have got filtered out but what happens is that 2 uh, 2.5 micron particulate matter they go down the windpipe and uh, we quite often in a, in a dusty area you will see you get a grime in your mouth you feel like spitting you feel like clearing up your throat that's because the nose has inhaled the particulate matter that goes down the trachea the windpipe and you get that uh, the the mucus layer on the windpipe tends to get the particulate matter stick and you feel like spitting it out or cleaning up your throat the further finer particulate matter like you know 1 micron and the smaller ones which are incredibly small i'll not get into describing how small they are 1000th of a hair uh, thickness of the hair it is so what they do is they get into the lungs and they get into the alveoli so they tend to harm us much more so there is a need for us to be sensitive about the particulate matter will not worry about the diameters micron 2.10 2.5 or 1 the point is we need to be sensitive about the particulate matter now as far as the corona virus is concerned these are even smaller i think dr kadambi in one of his slides talked about the diameter of particulate matter the the covid 19 um, virus is sort of bigger virus in terms of the size you know like it uh, in terms of the weight of the virus it's way lesser because it's a it's a rna dna with a thin layer of protein but in terms of the diameter it is say 0.125 micron to 0.5 micron that is i talked about 1 micron so the 0.125 to 0.5 micron so there are a set of technologies evolving to try and address the uh, prevention of ingestion by human beings uh different technologies one is physically preventing the particulate matter from getting into your lungs through a mask or a filter then there is a chemical treatment of air that's beginning to happen like for example how do you clean the air that's a technology by itself third is the ionization plasma ozonation such as the electromagnetic treatment of air if i may simplistically use a phrase uh the uh, killing the viruses through different processes such as ionization ozonization and plasma cold plasma therapy such treatments are coming to clean the air yes these the various technologies are evolving for making the inhaled air good and healthy and maybe next time when dr karim be covers the subject we'll get into the um, details mr vaidyanathan is there a um, uh, is there a systemic level like change that uh, uh, needs to happen for example during the delhi you know the smog and things like that now if that happens again this year there's a lot of concern saying because of the corona virus because of extensive mass usage already the lungs of a lot of people have uh, weakened um yeah. and you know even if there's technology that alerts people saying you are in a poor air quality or in a bad area there's not much a individual can do right when they're out in the street and it's there so can you touch upon is is it plausible to do you know a systemic level or a city level major changes to uh, help air quality as a whole uh it's a brilliant question let me address uh, there are three components to this um uh, one is you talked about the outside air uh, pollution and its sensitivity for the people second is for the people who got impacted in terms of the lung then right? then of course the third uh, particulate matter pollution as a carrier 
Now, Vivek in his slide, I put one particular slide where he talked of the Italian Valley, where there was a high incidence of um, COVID-19. There is research that's correct. There's huge amount of research that's going on in trying to understand what is the influence of atmospheric air in its ability to carry COVID virus. So there is no conclusive finding yet, but it does look like certain temperature, certain humidity uh, environments are more conducive for carrying, uh, conveying, as they say, communicating or conveying the coronaviruses. But the way they happen is just the way we talked about biological particles getting a coat of uh, chemical layer. What really happened in this is the coronavirus resides on a particulate matter and gets conveyed. So that is one matter, more research is being done. Now, you asked about Delhi. Now, that, that I tried to split into two parts. There was a study conducted by Harvard. About, you know, in USA, we all know there are more than 88,000 deaths. They have tried to drill it down to the county level incidence of, say, the fatalities, unfortunate though they are. What they found was the counties with higher historical pollution, the morbidity rate is higher. The perfect correlation, R squared correlation, RMSE, the statistical correlations have not yet come. But the first paper has come out that the highly polluted areas, historically highly polluted areas, when, are, when they are hit with COVID, the incidence is high. This sort of will lead to the second uh, branch okay. of my answer or what you also mentioned like if my lung capacity due to polluted air over last several years is impacted my vulnerability is higher because we know finally right. it is the ability of lungs to take I'll, the oxygen yeah, yeah. i'll just uh, interrupt you here because my thing is that as simple that you reduce the pollution and uh, more than 50 percent of the issues relating to the virus and spread of pathogens taking care yeah right? Taken care of. Sometimes the answer is so simple, it is glaring us in the face yep. and, and, and telling us that it's as simple as uh, reducing pollution. But uh, if we insist on going back to the old ways, again, the, what, what we are seeing, uh, again, cars on the road, again, the, 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 the systems that induce more of particulate matter, these pathogens are able to ride on them. So ride on them, absolutely. Is that. And I, I wish that this part is to be taken more seriously. And I know that you're in the clean air sector, you're building smart cities. It's only that the significance of such simple measures are realized. People are looking for complicated solutions. They always want solutions that can we attack that virus? How do we do vaccines? How do we create medicines against them? But a simple solution is live in clean air. Just live in an environment around you where there are trees and forests and, and uh, the atmosphere is clear. So sometimes no, that's a, Yeah, that's a very valid point. Um, I guess my uh, the uh, framing of my question was more on saying, you know, everyone uh, like Dr. John was focusing on individual care, like individuals taking charge of maintaining their clean air environment. Uh, and my question was, how effective is that, in your opinion, uh, Mr. Vaidyanathan, if there's not a systemic level change of improving the base air itself? How, how effective is these individual methods going to be in the long run if there is not a systemic change? You see, I mean, it's an excellent question. The reality is when you talk of a society, people are at different economic strata, different affordability and related, and sensitivities, uh, not as health, sensitivities in terms of civic uh, approach, civic sense and attitude. So I guess when you look at it, this a solution will emerge from multiple angles. And first is individual, the sensitive individual trying to protect himself and at least ensuring that he doesn't, convey to another person. Then comes uh, a sensitive establishment. Can you try to talk of taking care of the air? Now, the most unfortunate thing is the hospitals. We all know that hospitals create more bacterial infection due to poor yes. air circulation and hygiene. That's true. Now, yeah. So how do you do? Now, with this COVID, that's what we are trying to see if we can offer it as a solution. We just want to sensitize. You know, yes. it's not a question of sterilizing or plasma treatment. You'll be killing the good bacteria yes. also. It's a sustained... You kill everything. That's not the answer. Yeah, right. That's at second level. Third, of course, as Pooja, you pointed out, it is at a city level. The, this sensitivity, can you try to ensure that there is minimal 
you know, uh, you, in India, the air quality is extraordinarily high particulate matter everywhere. Can you try to ensure they are reduced? Because um, actually, if you try and see, we have done a topographic mapping of the district-wise incidence in uh, India of COVID. We all know 90% of COVID is in the cities area. Straight away, we know cities are polluted. Within yes. that, if you try to drill it down and come to districts, uh, the demographic profile, you see the density is higher, pollution level okay. historically has been higher. And Please reach out to us uh, if anyone has a suggestion on the next topic. My, my, my only prerequisite is it has to be disruptive, has to be very powerful. It this should not be a run of the mill. Run of the mill, everybody is running around the mill. We need to get out of the mill also and change our mindset. It makes it interesting. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank